March Madness is officially over, but players aren't done just yet jumping into the transfer portal. TST's Judith Altnew is in Studio B to give us an update on what the transfer portal looks like for Maryland. Judith? Yeah, guys, there are over 900 players in both the men's and women's college basketball transfer portals, and no school is safe from a wave of departures, and that includes both Maryland squads. Let's start with Kevin Willard's team. The Terps have seen four players enter the transfer portal with sophomores Noah Batchelor and Callum Swan Roger being the first. Freshman Jonathan Lamothe and Jamie Kaiser Jr. have since filed suit. Kaiser's departure has been the biggest surprise for the men's basketball team so far. Maryland fans had high expectations for the former four-star recruit and Virginia native. Kaiser's freshman campaign was an up and down one struggling to find his groove early on. But near the end, he flashed potential scoring double figures in five games throughout the season. Despite the departures, Willard has been active in the portal, adding two players so far. He brought in former Virginia Tech guard Rodney Rice, who was a former four-star star recruit. Rice grew up in Maryland and played high school basketball down the road at DeMatha and is now returning home. A junior has played in just eight collegiate games but averaged 7.4 points a game. He has two years of eligibility remaining and was ranked as the number 66, 66th player in the transfer, transfer portal, according to The Athletic. The other player Willard brought in is former Belmont point guard Jacoby Gillespie, who will replace Jameer Young next season. Gillespie is the number 13th best player in the transfer portal, according to The Athletic. During his two years at Belmont, Gillespie averaged 12.9 points per game. He's an, also a proven shooter, a place Maryland struggled with last season. Gillespie shot 38.7 from three-point range this past season and will pair nicely with Chance Stevens. He also has two years of eligibility left and gives the, player, and gives the Terps a player with 57 collegiate games under his belt. Now let's turn to Brenda Fries' squad. Fries has yet to add anyone from the transfer portal, but has had three players enter it, including glue player Faith Masonis. Masonis spent the last five years in College Park, but decided to find a new home for her sixth year of college basketball. Masonis had been a fan favorite and do-it-all player, excelling in rebounding and defense. She played 138 games as a Terp, averaging 6.0 points, 4.2 rebounds, and two assists a game. A huge loss for Freeze. The other members to leave the women's team include freshman Riley Nelson and, and Summer Bostick. Nelson is arguably the biggest loss for Maryland so far. Nelson was supposed to be a major contributor next year after recovering from her ACL injury that cut her freshman season short. The former five-star and 2022 and 2023 Maryland Gatorade Player of the Year averaged 5.1 points a game while coming off the bench this past season. Whenever team lands Nelson, we'll get a tremendous player. And guys, late Monday afternoon, freshman center Hawa Dumboya entered the transfer portal as well, becoming the fourth women's basketball player to do so. The portal is open until May 1st, so we'll see if any more Terps decide to enter and what other moves Willard and Freeze make. Back to you guys. Almost one year ago, fans at the Bob got to witness one of the rarest feats in sports. A perfect game. There's no words for that. You know, just an incredible performance. A nine inning perfect game had only happened 23 times in the MLB and 19 times in college until Ryan Ramsey added his name to the list. In a game that featured 13 runs, Ramsey's domination through Northwestern's lineup went a bit unnoticed in the early innings. After the seventh inning, it was the bottom of the seventh, we got back in the dugout. And I looked at the scoreboard just to kind of what I always do, and I saw a bunch of zeros, and I was like, well, that's interesting. Once Schliger realized Ramsey was doing something special, he sensed the moment, but tried to keep the same approach. I think there was a little bit more urgency in the eighth and in the ninth to just grab some of the balls that might be fringy ball strike and make them into a strike or present them well. Thanks in part to his rapport with Schliger, Ramsey finished off the 20th perfect game in NCAA history inducing a ground out for out number 27. Easier when your, your catcher is on the same page with you and understands your pitch sequences, what you're, what you're favoriting, um, and knows how to talk to you, especially, you know, there's sometimes you'll have mound visits um, and sometimes in between innings as well as you need to talk to your catcher about how you want to attack the next, next lineup of hitters. 
In a historic season for Maryland baseball, Ramsey's perfect game was another accomplishment on a long list that included winning the Big Ten regular season title and hosting a regional for the first time in program history. The Kansas City Royals drafted Ramsey in last year's MLB draft, and he's currently pitching for the Columbia Fireflies, the Royals' high-A affiliate. Yet, the perfect game has followed him. My teammates now even ask about it, you know, what was it like? Were guys talking to you? You know, when did when did people start to get quiet? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a cool thing to bring to the next level. Maryland volleyball earned their first home conference win of the season on outside hitter Layla Ivy's career day. Ivy recorded 18 kills as the Terps earned a three to one victory against Iowa. Maryland started off slow as Iowa claimed the first set 25 to 21. The Terps were without Raynell Jones and Layla Ricks for the second straight match, but Ivy picked up the slack starting in the second set. Ivy's three kills early helped Maryland jump out to a 15 to seven lead. Iowa would tie the set at 17 17 but Ivy recorded two more kills, helping the Terps take the second set, 25-23. to 23. She's got some tendonitis in her knees, and she's been battling with that. We had to give her a little time off this week to try to, you know, calm them down a little bit. So, you know, I don't even think she's playing at 100% right now, but she knew that, uh, you know, we needed her to go. And uh, I've talked to her in the first set, and, you know, she's in some pain and, and knows that, um, you know, she, we rely on her a lot of ways. And, you know, I thought um, she did a good job, got off to a good start. In the second, I think she had six or seven kills, which is kind of big for us. And then, um, you know, the... The, the bigger thing was she was doing it in clutch situations. Middle blocker Ellie Watson set the tone in the third set, opening with two aces. 12 Maryland kills and nine Hawkeye errors enabled the trip to dominate the third set, trouncing the Hawkeyes 25 to 14. The Hawkeyes would not go down without a fight. Maryland jumped out to a 12 to seven lead, but, but Iowa managed to tie the set up at 15-15. Iowa took a 20 to 17 lead, but the Terps mounted a comeback courtesy of two Iowa errors. Iowa forced set point at 24 to 22, but Maryland rallied scoring three straight points, taking a 25 to 24 lead. Ivy's last kill of the day and an Iowa attack error gave Maryland the 27 to 25 set for victory. We said like this is all we have. Like we got to communicate. We got to work together. Um, we can get through this. We just have to really be on everything and uh, control our side more than focusing on their side too much. Next up, the Terps will head back on the road to take on number nine Minnesota on Friday. For Terrapin Sports Central from the Xfinity Center Pavilion, I'm Judith Altnew. So right here, I have a multicolored dough filled with some apricot jam that one of my peers let me try. So let's see how it tastes. Much more crunchier than I thought, but it's good. Maryland Hill brought in local celebrity chef Paula Scheuer to lead a hum and tosh and baking activity with about 40 students. I'm a little bit of a fan girl. I have two of her cookbooks. One of them is autographed. And I was really excited to meet her and learn baking skills from her. Hum and tosh and our triangular shaped cookies with the filling in the middle. The Jews eat around Purim. Purim is a joyful holiday which celebrates the Jewish people's survival in Persia, which is now present day Iran. But it's, it's really fun for me to come to communities and bake with enthusiastic Jewish students and other Jewish adults. Students filled a colorful hum and tosh and dough with apricot or raspberry jam, chocolate chips, or blueberries. Within the next hour, the students combined to make close to 200 hum and tosh in. It's just really fun to go through the experience again and like fold it and everything. That's not something that you usually make um, under normal occasions. It's just this unique food. It's just really fun. From Marilyn Hillel, I'm Judith Altnew. So I'm Judith Altnew and I'm with Pedro Figueroa, the Flamingos first baseman who's player of the game today after going three for three with two doubles, one single and had three RBIs on the day in the Flamingos nine to five victory against the Wave in six innings. So how did you feel like your performance went today? I feel like it went well. I was able to get my pitches and just do my job with the pitches and I wasn't trying to do too much, just trying to get the bat head out and work. So what was your ability to kind of hit the ball really far out to get those two doubles and drive in those three critical runs that helped you guys win today's game? 
I was just able to stay on my backside and let the pitches get deep. So I wasn't trying to do too much, just trying to square it up and wherever it goes, it went. Like I just had a good advantage. I guess I know the Flamingos had been on a little bit of a downturn. You, your team had been. Um, sorry, getting distracted by the thunder here. Um, three game losing streaks. How did it feel to get a win today, even though? I felt really good. This team has We're been kind of up and back. down. That's why been up and down but we got some real dogs on this team and at our best I don't think anybody's better than us so hopefully we could keep it rolling and keep it going in the next game tomorrow. Okay sounds good thanks so much. Yeah thank you. Rolling. Okay so I'm Judith Altnew and I'm with some of our players of the game from the Colts 6-2 victory against the Kings. We have the pitchers Max Martzoff and Kai Etwaru. They each had six strikeouts today so I guess we'll start with Max because you were the starter today. How did you feel out on the mound getting all those strikeouts? And uh, I feel good. Uh, I know I can get ahead early with my fastball, like I usually do, and and breaking balls work later in the end of the game and later in the count. So it felt good to do what I usually do on the mound and help, I guess, help us get the win. I guess, Kai, what about um, your performance today? It felt good, you know. Just working on uh, a lot of all speed today. Got the job done. Got a couple ground balls to help keep it helped out. Is what do you? Oh, sorry. Uh, Did you have more? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, I guess I know you guys are leading the North. So how does it feel to get this kind of big win to keep you guys? Uh, it, feels, it feels good. Um, I would say it's like a momentum shift, ready for the playoffs, uh, knowing that we can have a chance to win this thing. Any any separate thoughts on that? Just gotta stay hot. Okay, I guess that's it from the pitchers. A, a player of the game video.